On this day last year, I was swimming in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. I was floating there, watching the sunlight dissipate into thousands of feet of ocean water. And it looked exactly as I thought it would. Vast, powerful, alien. There's a whole community of organisms that live in the middle of the ocean, just on the surface tension of the water. So I was really excited to get out there and see these little blue button jellies, electric blue sea slugs, and there's this little lightweight violet snail that blows afloat out of its own snot so it can live an upside down life hanging from the ceiling of the sea. So I'm floating out there underneath a sailboat that I was delivering to the BBIs with a couple of friends. They were swimming around the boat doing a lap, and then my vision refocused. Kind of the way that it does when you take your eyes off of traffic and then you finally see the dirt on your windshield. Floating in front of me was a little white confetti-sized piece of plastic. My eyes refocused again and there, maybe 10 feet deeper and a little farther away was another. This little tattered red strip of plastic ribbon with a crustacean hanging onto it nearby as well. Now, we had seen whole plastic chairs on the way out, a couple of cigarette lighters and maybe a few balloons out on the horizon, but the ocean is enormous. You can definitely find uh, huge dent er, plastic trash uh, piles floating around out there. You can find whole plastic bottles, uh, mylar balloons with the fading remains of forgotten birthdays and open houses. But that's not what the majority of plastic pollution in the ocean actually looks like. You have to be out there to get a sense of scale. So I'll try to give that to you now. Plastic is an oil product. It is engineered to be incredibly strong. It does not break down in the environment. Every piece of plastic ever created still exists in the environment today. It entangles wildlife in just about every ecosystem on the planet. And in the ocean, sunlight and seawater break the plastic apart into tiny little pieces that still retain some harmful chemical properties and are able to absorb other persistent organic pollutants like PCBs, DDT, dioxins, all carcinogens, and then transport those into the oceanic food web when they're ingested by marine animals. Those, those toxins then build up in concentration into our seafood and eventually into us. Now, we used to think that all plastic floats, but that isn't true. We found plastic on the surface, but also in the midwater and on every beach of every body of water around the planet, including the Great Lakes. We've even found plastic in the deep sea. The deep sea is as far from you can, you can get <coughs> from civilization and still be on this planet, and yet our plastic trash is already waiting for us there. Now, I'm not saying anything new here. This has all been covered very well in the media and in science. There was even a whole TEDx event on this in 2011 in Santa Monica, California. Recently, scientists at Sea Education Association and Scripps Institute of Oceanography estimated that there are about 8 million tons of plastic trash entering the ocean worldwide every year. 8 million metric tons of trash. We use these huge numbers when we talk about plastic pollution in the ocean, but most people can't get their head around what 8 million metric tons of anything looks like. So, let's talk about scale. The Pacific Ocean takes up about half the planet. The Atlantic takes up about half of the other half. In an area the size of an ocean, 8 million metric tons of plastic pollution looks like the tiny, pathetic plastic confetti that I was seeing on my swim. Now, this photograph was taken by a scientist named Miriam Goldstein on a research cruise in the Pacific in 2009. She was out there to study plastic, and this tool that she's holding is called a quadrat. A quadrat is just a device that scientists use to make estimates of, of things within a given area. In this case, it's a one meter square. Scientists then take the data they, ca uh, they count in a quadrat and apply statistics to extrapolate an area estimate of whatever it is that they're studying. And normally, these would be things like algae on a reef or the number of clams in a patch of mud, you would never use a quadrat in the middle of the ocean because the probability of finding plastic in a one meter square randomly placed in an area the size of three quarters of the planet is zero. <clears throat> the floating piles of trash and the entangled animals that you see in the media are definitely out there. You guys have all seen photos of this, but the majority of plastic pollution in the ocean is in the form of this microplastic. And it breaks down into microscopic pieces even that still retain their harmful chemical properties. There's a researcher on the West Coast who studies plastic named Marcus Erickson who refers to this as a plastic smog. It is everywhere, diffuse, and inescapable. When you go to the beach, when you go swimming, surfing, or sailing, and you see these little tiny pieces of plastic, they should represent to you a global pollution. 
The solution for dealing with plastic pollution in the ocean needs to be proportionate to the scale of the problem. Now, I'm sure that you guys all recycle. That is to say, you guys put your stuff in the blue recycling bin. Right? How many people think that that material that was used to make that plastic bottle is melted down and made into a new plastic bottle of equal value? That's what recycling is supposed to mean, right? You take the old material and make an equivalent new thing. How many people think that the purpose of recycling overall is to reduce the amount of plastic waste in the world? I thought that stuff, and it's not true. Plastic cannot be recycled, not in the way that we think. Um, <clears throat> you can melt down glass and metals and make an equivalent thing out of that material, but not plastic. You guys have all seen this, this chasing arrow symbol, right? Uh, this means that things are supposed to be recyclable. It doesn't. It actually doesn't mean anything at all. This is just a frame for the number that tells you what type of plastic any given product is made of. Number one is polyethylene terephthalate, or PET plastic. This is what most of your plastic bottles are made of. And the chasing arrow symbol does not mean that it can or will be recycled. It's essentially just advertising, because people continue to believe that these materials are going to be recycled and reused to make new things once they go into the trash. The majority of plastic waste gets shipped off to other countries like China, where they are, um, they extract some of the, the plastic waste like PET and they're able to downcycle it into lower quality, long lasting materials like polar fleeces or outdoor decking. But those things, once they're done with their usefulness, are going to be, um, end up in landfill because they, uh, they're not going to break down. So <clears throat> they'll either end up in the landfill or they'll end up in the environment. So they'll extract those, and then the rest of the plastic that they have, they'll just burn and release those toxic chemicals out into the atmosphere along with the carbon that, that they're made of. Mismanaged waste, litter, trash blowing off the back of trucks, this is how 8 million tons of plastic trash is entering the ocean every year. It's lightweight, so when it lands on the ground, it washes downstream. The EPA in 2013 reported that in our country, we only recovered 9% of the plastic produced in the entire country. So only 9% of all of that plastic packaging we have recovered into our waste system, and the other 91% is out there in the environment somewhere. Now, what about alternatives? What about bioplastics? Plastics that are said to be made of plants or compostable or biodegradable are still just plastic. There's no legal definition for what compostability or biodegradability means. So, products that are advertised as compostable or biodegradable do not break down in the environment. They don't even break down in industrial compost machines. Those potato-based plastics don't break down. So probably the, the question that's on everyone's mind right now is, what the heck do I do with this plastic bottle that I'm drinking water out of all day? And to answer that question, you should still put it in, into the recycling because that is the only place that there's a chance that, that material might be reused. Single-use plastics do not add value to our lives. We use them for such a short amount of time and then we never think about that material after it's used. We have no actual attachment to it. We've only been using plastic for about 60 years. And we did just fine without it before then. People still ate out at restaurants, people still drank coffee, we fell in love and we made tiny people. We have no attachment to those actual individual products that we're using. But I want you guys to be honest with me now. How many people saved your favorite spork? This one's mine. I was just thinking the other day about the adorable way that neither speared nor scooped my food very efficiently. Such times we had. No, these things don't add any value to our lives and the trade-off for temporary use is not worth that material lasting in the environment forever. You guys are probably feeling a familiar little guilt right now. The plastics industry has sold us on the idea that personal recycling is going to take care of the problem, right? If everyone would just recycle, there'd be no pollution. There'd be no trash out there and nature would be nice and clean if it wasn't for all those terrible people that don't recycle. We have no one else to blame but ourselves. We're still so sold on this idea that we continue to teach platitudes to our children that reflect our responsibility in taking care of plastic pollution, even while we continue to use these products. So you guys, same with me now. What are the three R's for saving the world? Reduce, reuse, recycle, right? And even when we say refuse, we're still in a way taking credit for that material. 
But before you guys start feeling too bad, I have an important question for you. By a show of hands, how many people in the audience have ever been approached by a major corporation and asked whether or not you want your products packaged in plastic? No hands, right? Nobody, you didn't make that stuff in the first place. Plastic material is continue, continuing to be made because it's making money for corporations. You had no say in the creation of that material, and wouldn't you design your product better? We need to stop using a material that lasts in the environment forever for temporary or single uses. Now, waterfront cities like Newport have a, a powerful financial, cultural, and historical investment in maintaining a healthy waterfront. Whether you are a boater, you have a business on the, on the waterfront, or you just live in a town whose waterfront is the engine for your local economy, you have a vested interest in maintaining the healthy waterways that are free of plastic. And there are great solutions already underway, some of those right here in Newport. Sailors for the Sea and 11th Hour Racing are sponsoring waste-free regattas and clean events. Uh, clean Ocean Access hosts beach cleanups and has installed plastic collection devices in the harbor. Uh, there's even a movement afoot to deal with the little plastic straw that end up on our beaches and in our waterways. These, these are all great solutions, and they are combined they are necessary for dealing with the waste that is already out there, but this is still just on the cleanup end. We need to start dealing with plastic waste before it is created. We need to cut off the waste at the source. Plastic production is still increasing, and if we don't deal with the waste ahead of time, we're never going to get out of the smog. All of the waste-free events, all the personal recycling, and all of the beach cleanups are not happening at a pace that is fast enough to deal with the amount of plastic that we produce and consume it isn't. Just as individual plastic bottles and mylar balloons do not represent the scale of the worldwide pollution, your individual efforts to recycle at home do not match the scale of the solutions needed to solve it. Now, Newport is not alone in the world in trying to deal with plastic pollution. We have several cities around the United States that have important waterways like Austin, Texas, San Francisco, and Long Beach, California. And they've all been able to successfully ban the sale of things like styrofoam, plastic water bottles, plastic grocery bags, and even plastic drink bottles. France just banned the sale and use of plastic cutlery and dishware in the entire country. Amazing, right? I heard an O in the back. So <clears throat> lots of countries around the world have implemented laws called extended producer responsibility laws. These laws hold manufacturers responsible for the, the entire life cycle of the material that they create. In Germany, their EPR laws required manufacturers of plastic packaging to take that packaging back. So government worked with local businesses to try to redesign the packaging so they reduced the overall amount of packaging and they redesigned it to make it out of better materials than plastic. And they got their recovery rate up to 75%. 75% is huge. 75% of all of the packaging produced in an entire country is now back into the waste stream and not in the environment. So remember that in the United States, our recovery rate is only 9%. Plastic is cheap. The glut of low value materials in our recycling stream is messing up the recycling stream by reducing the amount of glass and higher value metals causing our recycling infrastructure to fail. Many manufacturers are taking the recycling, the stuff that you put into the blue bin, and they're moving that directly to landfill because it isn't worth trying to sell it to another country. You are paying for materials that you had no choice in creating. Taking responsibility for, for a hazardous material um, through your tax money, so money that you pay for municipal waste, your taxes, my taxes, cover the cost of collection, disposal, and recycling. Using that money to pay for materials that we had no say in creating is tantamount to corporate welfare. So here in North America, we're lagging behind the rest of the world with regards to passing EPR laws. We do have one good example that's fairly close to home. So in British Columbia, Canada, they just implemented their first EPR laws only two years ago. Multi-Materials BC worked with businesses there to um, make those businesses responsible for the packaging that they produce. So it's no longer in the hands of the citizens. Those manufacturers now have to pay for the curbside collection and recycling of that material. And they've gotten their, recycling, their recovery rate up to 80%. 80% is fantastic. So 80% of all of the packaging material produced in that region 
has been recovered and is now not in the environment. We have great examples. There's already momentum for doing this. We know that it can be a success. Right here in the United States, we also have interest in doing this, but we're a little behind. Here in Rhode Island, there's a company called Upstream that's working with partners all around the country to try to implement EPR legislation to make uh, EPR laws that are good for both businesses and for consumers. Just last year, Upstream introduced legislation to the Rhode Island Congress that would include the cost of collection, disposal, and recycling in the price of the product ahead of time. Now, that's good because that means that you're not paying for any materials that you don't use. So your tax dollars would no longer be going to pay for the, the plastic material that anyone else in the state has used. And that's a win for everybody. Now, in sculpting new EPR laws, it's going to take dedicated effort on the part of our politicians and our citizens and continued application. Even as they're conceived, lobbyists from the, the plastic industry are going to try to influence those laws to continue to make as much money as possible. Every state, including Rhode Island, has several lobbyists that are paid by the American Chemistry Council. Now, this is a corporate lobby group that's made up of businesses like Exxon, Mobil, Dow Chemical, DuPont, 3M, and even the Publicly Traded Waste Management Corporation. So I need to include a caveat that any new EPR legislation is going to have to exclude any of the, the plastics that are on the market today because they are not recyclable. Um, we need to treat those as a hazardous, non-recyclable waste and, and expect corporations to innovate a closed-loop, uh, cradle-to-cradle system that is actually cost-effective where we get to reuse that same material over again. It just takes momentum. So, leaving you guys with vague political solutions is a terrible thing to do. So I'll give you one more. Money talks in our country. Every time you spend money, you are casting a vote. You vote with your dollars, even your children can vote. If you want your packaging produced in a way that is not harmful to you or to the environment, take the time to tell businesses and corporations what you want as a consumer, especially talk to local businesses in person. Email, write, call them. Corporations are run by very smart people and they know that when you take the time to call them, you are representing a larger percent of the population that feels the same way. So, Contacting them directly is a way to magnify your voice and your influence. Tell them, keep telling them until we get momentum. In our lifetimes, mine and yours, we will not ever be able to go back out into Earth's greatest wilderness, into the ocean, without finding our plastic trash waiting for us there. The little flecks of plastic that you see on the beach represent a global pollution. We need solutions that are able to deal with the pollution that invades every part of everyone's shared ocean. Plastic does not belong in the ocean.